They filmed Band of Brothers in this one. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today we're going to have a look at a truly remarkable aircraft. First she revolutionized commercial aviation. Then during World War II the Allies used her to drop paratroopers behind enemy lines, most notably in Sicily, Normandy and Arnhem, but also in Southeast Asia. It even supplied a whole city during the Berlin airlift and after that it saw service in Korea and Vietnam, as well as being the airliner of choice for many years. It even landed on the North and South Pole. Is it any wonder then that it is, is remembered as one of the greatest aircraft of all times? The Douglas C-47 Skytrain. The story of the Skytrain, or Dakota if you're Commonwealth, starts way before World War II, in the golden years of aviation, the interwar years. So before I head inside and show you how she works, let's quickly go over the history of this aircraft, which somebody once called the plane that changed the world. Following the end of the Great War in 1918, aviation was explored not only for its military application, but also for commercial enterprises. On the one side was transportation of goods or mail, and then eventually the ferrying of people from one city to another. It remained the prerogative of the rich and powerful, but flying captivated people around the world. And where there is a market, there will be a product. In 1933, the Douglas Aircraft Company had already a line of mail carriers, but it entered the field of commercial aviation with the DC-1, DC standing aptly for Douglas Commercial. It did so essentially on the invitation of one of the main airline companies of the time, TWH, Transworld Airlines. It needed a plane that was commercially viable and reliable since, after some tragic accidents, the field of commercial aviation was under some scrutiny and getting more and more regulated to make sure that safety standards are adhered to. The DC-1 then was one of the first all-metal, low-wing twin-engine aircraft of its type with a good range and speed. Maintenance too was comparatively easy and the plane was a lot more solidly constructed than previous transporters. In fact, in one of the early tests that doctors conducted on the wings, it had one of the senior designers drive over it with a steam roller, and the wing survived. Outperforming then its older competitors, it looked positively avant-garde at the same time. Indeed, when it set off on its maiden flight in 1933, its look didn't fit the time frame, something rather you'd expect out of the 40s and 50s. And the reason for this is that the DC-type aircraft essentially set a gold standard for a the future commercial aircraft. The DC-1 provided but a template of what was to come, as it had only a production run of one aircraft, yes, one single aircraft. Competing against the Boeing Model 247, Douglas jumped straight to the DC-2 in 1934. This aircraft took what was the DC-1, scrubbed off the edges, increased the passenger count from 12 to 14, and it was then ready to hit the commercial market. The first order came from TWH for 20 machines, but that wasn't the end of the story. Suddenly, major airline companies approached Douglas, and Donald Douglas himself, who had not expected the commercial market to have so much of a demand, was very surprised. Amongst the big names was Dutch carrier KLM, Lot from Poland, Swiss Air, and Spanish Iberia. Production licenses also went to Netherlands and Japan. A final production run of just under 200 aircraft had put Douglas on the map as a forward-thinking and reliable aircraft company. The DC-2 had not invented commercial travel, but it was the next step, offering air travel that was not only comfortable, but also safe, reliable and fast. Foreshadowing what is to come, Douglas was now also approached by the military. Around 60 of the 200 built aircraft eventually went to the US Armed Forces. These came in various iterations, but one most notable difference was the specific production run of two short dozen C-33s and military redesignations. These aircraft were built specifically for transport with a reinforced interior cabin, large doors at the back and a cable hoist to ease the handling of cargo. With the astonishing success that Douglas had with the DC-2, it wasn't a surprise that the company decided to continue development of the airframe. Already in 35, a flying example was ready and the maiden flight's date was chosen well. The 17th December 1935, exactly on the day, 32 years after the Wright brothers had made their first powered flight. 
It was slightly longer and wider than the DC2 and featured a more powerful version of the already used Wright R1820 radial engines and it introduced fully favorable propellers. And it was, surprisingly, a sleeper aircraft fitted with around 16 bunk beds. It was the DST, which also became known as the Douglas Sleeper Transport. In any case, the aircraft could also be refitted with normal seats. After a handful of DSTs were built, the DC-3 entered the scene with 21 passenger seats. At the time, the eventual success of the plane could not have been foreseen. Some experts even questioned whether the market could handle any more than 25 DC-3s without becoming oversaturated. That estimation was off by a wee margin of a couple of hundred aircraft. The DC-3 continued to hold a reputation for safety and reliability even after a few accidents. Apparently, the record of this aircraft alone opened up a completely new market for insurance brokers whom for the first time felt safe in selling travel insurance and work insurance to travelers, stewardesses and pilots. And as we know now, the Douglas aircraft became so closely embedded in the explosion of commercial aviation in the mid to late 1930s that, especially in America, there was no way of getting around this uh, aircraft, the DC-3. A plane that so perfectly encapsulates the spirit of commercial aviation. It was the carrier of its time, whether for cargo, passengers or the military. Again, just like with the DC-2, the military actually had a portfolio of variants, each under another designation. For example, when the Army Air Corps put in their initial order of one aircraft, they designated it as the C-41A. Once the Army Air Force appeared on the scene and the budget opened up a little bit, things started to look very differently. Eventually, the main contender was the plane we now know as the C-47. A few hundreds had been produced for commercial use, but this was just a fraction of the actual aircraft's total production run. Over 10,000 C-47 variants had been built by the United States, with another three to 5,000 built on the license in the Soviet Union. Uh, sources vary on the exact number there. These were known as the Lisonov Li-2. The Soviet variants also had a defensive turret in the top and additional windows in the rear for optional firing positions. American or British C-47 generally only added defensive firepower in special circumstances, for example, in their supply drops over Burma. 400 DC-3 type aircraft were built in Japan. Yes, you heard right, Japan. In 1938, Nakajima Aircraft Company actually purchased a license for the DC-3, initially producing these for the civilian market. As in the US, these aircraft were later either seized by the armed forces or modified into a separate production run, and they became known as the L2D Type O transport, or as the Allies called them, TABI. Just like in the armies of the United States, the Soviet Union and Britain, the L2D Type O was an absolutely crucial instrument in ferrying supplies for the armed forces, just that it flew on the other side. And while we are on the topic, Germany too operated a handful, either by impressing them from civilian airliners or by capturing them on the battlefield. Now, with some quick rule of thumb math here, we arrive at a spectacular production run of 15 to 16,000 aircraft. 16,000 of these. That's about the production run of the P-51 fighter. And if that doesn't explain the significance of this aircraft, I don't know what will. We will head inside in just a minute, but it serves to quickly go over why the C-47 became so important. Initially, the United States Army hadn't really foreseen a need for a dedicated transporter since lacking defensive firepower, it was vulnerable and just, well, another burden on the budget. The initial idea was to just use bombers in a transport role and call it a day. It transpired that that wasn't the best of ideas. The internal layout between a bomber and a transporter was vastly different, even if the actual space on paper seemed the same. The Marine Corps especially realized the importance of a dedicated transporter in their deployments to Latin America, but this was mainly based around well, logistics and uh, medical transports. You could argue that it was the German offensive into the Low Countries in 1940, where airborne units were successfully used and rapid relocation of logistical resources was required, that provided an operational example that a transport aircraft, also capable of delivering paratroopers, was perhaps of benefit to the United States. Had the US, among other nations, looked more closely at the Second Sino-Japanese War of 1947, in which China was actually the first to use DC-2s and DC-3s in logistical support roles, perhaps this realization could have come a little bit sooner. It's somewhat peculiar then how a Japanese company actually bought a production license to the DC-3 following the outbreak of that war. In any case, Douglas was approached to convert the airliner into what would be the C-47. Based on the early experiments already mentioned, the C-47 had reinforced flooring, a large cargo door, as well as the addition of military spec equipment. 
Those aircraft going to the Navy were known as the R4Ds. Another version was the C-53, which retained the smaller airliner door at the back instead of the cargo configuration. The B-18 Bolo bomber can also track its lineage to the DC-3. The C-47 would start to ferry men and material in the US, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, especially in the latter area. The Allies became reliant on air transport to supply cutoff troops. The stories accompanying these deployments speak highly of the resilience, versatility and reliability of the C-47 and it became the quintessential logistical support aircraft of the Allies. As one pilot once put it, you could wreck a duck, but you can't wear it out. It operated in all theaters and not only by the Americans. The British and Commonwealth forces received about 2,000 and as always gave her a new name, Dakota. The C-47 would eventually be used for anything and everything, but during World War II it also became noteworthy for its airborne role, dropping paratroopers behind enemy lines, notably in Normandy, Arnhem and Sicily. On the 6th of June 1944, around about 800 C-47 struck more than 13,000 US paratroopers into Normandy, while the Kotas brought in parts of the British contingent, either themselves or by gliders. Just under 1,000 of these aircraft were used to drop airborne units into France, kickstarting the liberation of Europe. In the ensuing chaos, few things went according to plan, but German General Karl Student, himself a authority on airborne operations, commented that the Allied airborne units contributed substantially to the success of D-Day. C-47s would then also later be used to drop uh, 1,400 net tonnage of supplies into Normandy until the coastside forces could finally link up with the Paris. From June 13 onwards, they were also involved in the first medical evacuations by air from the French mainland, flying out numerous wounded men tended by WAF air ambulance nurses. And thus we turn to the aircraft behind me. This is a C-47 Dakota 4 or C-47B if you like. At 19.4 meters in length, she has a wingspan of 29.4 meters and stands at 5.2 meters. Operated by a crew of four, the pilot, the co-pilot, navigator and radio operator. And she is powered by two Pratt & Whitney R1830s, 14-cylinder radial engines equipped with a two-speed supercharger. These produce around about 1,200 horsepower each and propel the aircraft to a speed of around 220 miles an hour. That is roughly 350 kilometers an hour at 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters. Uh, she'd cruise at about 160 miles an hour, that's 250 kph. Of course, as a transport aircraft, operational range is important and 1,600 miles, 2,600 kilometers, is nothing to be ashamed about. Although this could even be extended with additional internal fuel tanks. She would also carry 28 paratroopers, a cargo, airborne equipment or a mixture thereof, to a maximum weight of 6,000 pounds or 2,400 kilograms. I actually found a really neat uh, file recently in the archives showing all the tests they did with the different equipment to be carried, um, riveting stuff really. Uh, you had uh, assembled jeeps, anti-aircraft guns, anti-tank guns, motorbikes and the lot. In any case, the C-47 was a fantastic transporter and compares very, very favorably to the slightly older German Army's equivalent, the Junkers Ju-52. Now let's hop inside. This aircraft was delivered to RAF Ferry Command in 1942. It's actually quite spectacular because she saw service around the world. Australia, Ceylon, Egypt and the Middle East. And she was donated to the museum in 2001, who still spool up the engines here for visitors during special events. And of course, she was also used in the series Band of Brothers, with filming taking place inside the actual aircraft. Let's get inside. We find ourselves in the passenger or cargo compartment. It is here where up to 28 paratroopers dressed in full kit would be waiting to jump into enemy territory. Uh, the seats over there are actually original. So if you come to the museum, uh, please don't sit on them. Whereas the plastic seats you see all around the aircraft and where I'm sitting on were actually installed for the filming of Band of Brothers. Um, the interior here is as it should be during an airborne assault. Uh, you can see the static lines, you can of course see the seats and all the equipment um, just as it would be if you were jumping into Normandy, Arnhem or anywhere else really. Now let's go into the part that you usually won't see, the cockpit and the crew stations. Uh, here we have the radio operator's position. He is of course a critical member of the crew, uh, keeping in touch with the flight uh, ground-based installations, but also he would be the one homing in on radio signals to keep the aircraft 
well, on course. When the Allies jumped into Normandy, they did so during a very cloudy night to make sure that the aircraft was, well, on course. And the radio operator followed the Pathfinder beacon set by some specialized teams that jumped, well, they jumped a couple of hours before the main invasion in an attempt to get as close as possible then to the target zone. That didn't always work out, but you know, you've got to remember that only about a third of the Pathfinders actually managed to find their target location. So as long as you flew south towards France, you'd arrive in the right postcode. Talking about navigation, here is the navigator's position. He has what you'd expect, um, a table for a map and his instruments with a lamp here. Uh, together with the radio operator, he'd assist navigation and make sure that the plane goes where it is supposed to go. Uh, he also helps with calculating fuel consumption. Uh, again, his station is a relatively comfortable one. This used to be the kind of the male compartment of the DC-3. Um, and we can see here, there is still that auxiliary door up front that would have been used for um, you know, putting mail off the aircraft. You can still see it in the military variants, but it's not really used. Uh, the navigator here also has an observation dome up top. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much his position. And let's go up to the cockpit. Right, the pilot together with the co-pilot operator C-47. Uh, the engine controls are in the middle and flight instruments are of course up front with an electrical panel up top. Um, you'll also find some auxiliary systems all around the cockpit. Now the thing to remember with this aircraft is that it had a career post-war. So the crew stations and the way we see the dials right now actually reflect that. Usually the co-pilot would have more dials relating to the engine and the engine's operation, whereas here his, his, um, his instruments are more or less mirrored to the ones that he has with the pilot. So if we get in here a little bit, we of course have the uh, pedestal um, with the red designating the mixture control, we have the throttle and we have the uh, prop pitch. We've got the fuel cocks to either side and uh, once we swing over that, you can actually see some of the uh, gauges relating to the engine. So we've got oil pressure over here, we've got uh, RPMs, we've got the manifold pressure and the fuel pressure. To the left and on the pilot side, we've got, of course, an important clock. We've got speed and an artificial horizon. We've got the altitude, we've got a turn and bank, we've got a climb, descent, we've got a navigational directional gyro, we've got a compass, and then we have also got the de-icing pressure, of course, which you would use. Now, in the, um, the manual actually does say for the icing that it's important to use the heaters first and then the de-icing system. Now, if we shuffle over to the navigator's position, the main gauges that are different are related to temperature of the cylinder head and the oil. You also got uh, some of the uh, fuel gauges right here. Before we go to the uh, electrical systems up top, um, it serves mentioning really that the position in itself, for me, as somebody who is about one meter 90, that's six foot two, maybe, um, it's relatively okay. But I can see myself being a little bit cramped in here with actual gear on, especially if, you know, if, if I would be flying into Normandy with, with protection at rest and so on. Clearance to the rudder is a little bit cramped for myself. I can adjust the seat somewhat. Um, but it's not going to be helping all that much. So for my size, uh, a little bit cramped. Um, the, the armrest is a nice little touch. There we go. So yeah, let's shuffle up to the electrical system. A navigational lighting, a landing light. We've got navigational lights. Then we've got, of course, the de-icer. Uh, we've got a pitot tube and the heaters. We've got a starter, the engine primer, the booster pumps. Once again, the icer and cockpit lights. Yeah, that's pretty much the, the important bits and bobs. We've got the inverters, of course, here and of course the uh, prop feather right there. As you can see, for example, also the radio equipment here is relatively modern. All right, starting here up now. Uh, assuming we've followed all the preliminaries, we prepare to, of course, start the engines. With the auxiliary battery card connected, we would be using, um, of course, that power source. Otherwise, we would be using the onboard power supply. Now, the C-47 is sometimes equipped with a crossfeed. In that case, this should be turned off. And after that, the right engine's uh, fuel tank, the main uh, fuel tank, should be selected right here. Now, in the C-47, it is, it is somewhat of a tradition to start with the starboard, the right engine first, that's number two. In the DC-3, when passengers were boarding in the 
the rear of the aircraft. They were coming in from the port side. So with that engine running, that would be extremely inconvenient and you would probably not get any good reviews on TripAdvisor. So the pilot instead would be starting number two, which is out of the way. And that also speeds up the departure because once all the passengers are in, you can just have to start up number one and that's it. We make sure also that the left tank, which we find over here, is turned to off. After that, we will open the throttle um, forward. We will have the mixture on idle cutoff just in the position that it is right now. We'd also move the propeller pitch fully forward. At this point, you make sure that the carburetor air intake is set to cold and the cowl flaps for the right engine, for the one you're starting up, and I set to open. Now the propeller should essentially be um, rotated by hand three or four times full revolutions um, by the ground staff and obviously the co-pilot and the pilot will keep an eye on that as they're doing it. Uh, the fuel booster pumps should be to on and after that you will raise the fuel pressure uh, to roughly two to three pounds to square inch with the hand pump. Then you, um, well, you have the window open, you shout clear so that the ground crew will get away from the propeller and nothing interferes. Uh, the main ignition should be switched to on for the uh, right engine. And after that, we hold down the energizer or we would hold down the energizer right here to flee 20 seconds and uh, we prime if need be and then hit the mesh. And once that catches, really, you release those uh, levers. Move the mixture up to auto rich at this point. Continue to um, operate the hand pump until the engine really runs smoothly if need be. As well as that, you keep generally uh, the engine uh, on a relatively idle setting of uh, 600 to 800 RPMs. Um, you will obviously check that on the, on the dials and you keep an eye on the oil pressure. Once everything has stabilized, you can go up to roughly a thousand RPMs and you keep the uh, engine nice, uh, running nice and uh, smoothly uh, at a low pitch setting. You don't go over 230 degrees Celsius on the cylinder heads, but before you take off and taxi, you should have the oil above 40 degrees. Once you have all done all that and the second engine is running smoothly, you essentially select the left fuel tank to the main and then you do the same process with the second engine. And once you've done that, you're ready to uh, taxi. World War II was not the end of the C-47's career. It went on to resupply Berlin during the airlift. It was used in Korea and in many subsequent conflicts. In Vietnam, she actually became a gunship. Throughout this time, she was called many names. Skytrain, Dakota, Gooniebord, Spooky, Puff the Magic Dragon. But at the end, of the day, she was just an honest DZ-3 and she would fly and fly and fly no matter how you wrecked her. And of course, the last production order meant that the vast supply of airframes was available and that mainly airlines and military organizations jumped at the chance to acquire some post-war. In fact, the Douglas aircraft proliferated to the point where, well, the list of countries operating such aircraft might very well outstrip that of those countries that didn't. And now, in 2019, just about 200 that's still in flight worthy condition. What a machine. Thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider supporting future videos via Patreon or PayPal. It's extremely important and helpful in order to allow me to produce this kind of content. Please also share this video far and wide. And I want to thank the Yorkshire Air Museum for allowing me to get close with their exhibit and showing it to all of you guys. And of course, you can visit it here in York. As always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.